The past year has been a roller coaster ride for so many of us, both physically and emotionally. But as we slowly emerge from the pandemic restrictions and lockdown, to find ourselves returning to some version of normal, not everyone is going to bounce right back. May marks Mental Health Awareness Month, and it is a good time to look at the impact that the pandemic and its fallout have had on mental health and those who had challenges to begin with. And a new study shows that one out of every three patients who recovers from COVID-19 may have lingering psychiatric or neurological issues, which might just be the new pandemic. And as children return to school, how will this experience affect them? Are there new fears, new adaptive behaviors that we'll see? We take a look at all these aspects of mental health when Fox 11 News in depth starts right now. Hello everyone and welcome to Fox 11 News In Depth. I'm Marla Tejas in for Hal Eisner who is still on medical leave. The last year, well, more than a year now, has been supremely taxing in so many ways. We've experienced stresses, fears, isolation, some of us profound grief. Well, here during Mental Health Awareness Month, let's take a look at the toll it's taking on all of us. And joining us to talk about our mental health is psychiatrist Dr. Ricardo White. He is affiliated with Community Hospital of San Bernardino. Welcome to the show, Dr. White. We thank you for your, your time and your services. Hi, Marla. Thank you so much for having me. I want to start by asking you uh, if you've seen a shift in the mental health issues among your patients since the start of the pandemic, since March of 2020. Absolutely. Um, job loss has been a major precipitant for inpatient admissions. Um, at times, people have had trouble refilling their medications. Um, yeah, so, so there have definitely been some, some activities, uh, some trends that have shifted somewhat uh, as a result of the pandemic. And have you seen more and more patients this past year than as far as you know in terms of your career, for instance? There has been an ebb and a flow, but there were, there were times that there was spiking. It was at times offset by people actually fearing coming into the hospital. Mm. Um, but at other times, uh, there was also an increase um, as people got overwhelmed by some of the stressors and the precipitants that you would expect from a pandemic. COVID-19 syndrome, COVID-19 anxiety, I should say, uh, is now a syndrome. And it's one of those things where even when people are getting vaccinated, they're having fears about going out into the real world. Is that something that you're seeing? Yeah, there, there are definitely so many unknowns. And with unknowns, of course, you're going to get associated anxiety. Um, and so, so, yeah, these are some of the dilemmas that we're having to uh, wrestle with. Um, so no question about it. What about the stigma that is associated with having, a, you know, some sort of a mental health issue? Uh, if people are afraid to come forward, uh, what's your advice to them? Um, we absolutely uh, want to come forward. Um, we have to thank some very brave celebrities at times who are, you know, kind of uh, blazing the trail to actually announce the fact that they have a mental health disorder. Um, and actually letting us know that, hey, that there's nothing to be ashamed of. And as you voice your need for help, it helps others to do that as well. And little by little, we're going to erode this stigma of having a mental health condition. Yeah, it helps to have advocates out there and say there's no shame. And, you know, taking care of your mental health is should be number one, uh, because it's hard to function if, if y y you don't you don't you don't feel good mentally. Oh, no question about it. Obviously, it's a, it's central and core um, to our performance, both at home and at work. What about specific symptoms? What should people be looking for? Because, you know, everyday life before the pandemic can be overwhelming. But then you add on the pandemic and it's hard to make sense of really what you're feeling. So let's talk about some of the symptoms that people should be looking forward to uh, looking at and then when it's time to seek that professional help. The principal thing you're paying attention to is function. And when we're talking about mental health disorders, we're looking at loss of function. So your inability to get out of bed, your inability to attend to activities of daily living, such as whether it's eating or grooming, things like brushing your teeth um, or taking care of yourself. You're noticing that you're not enjoying the things that you would normally enjoy. Um, just 
losing your motivation uh, for living. And obviously, if that escalates to the point where you're actually having thoughts of harming yourself, mm. you absolutely want to get in touch with a hotline. Um, you're calling 911 or getting, getting in touch with your, your, your mental health care provider. Um, but these can be some of the principal things that you take a look at, um, both in yourself or in someone you love. You're paying attention to change in behavior and loss of function. Being locked down was such a change for, for all of us. There are people out there, introverts, who may have, you know, really adapted well to it because they had a hard time being social anyway. And now that the world's opening back up, what's your advice to people who are, who would consider themselves an introvert? It may have been hard on introverts either way because whereas they, they were normally maybe at home alone, now with people mm. being pressured to be at home, maybe mm. there were more people they had to be actually associating with. But as, they're, as the pressure is increasing for them to go back out, um, it's, it's worth exploring, reconnecting with a mental health provider. One of the things the pandemic has done is it has made telehealth, so utilizing technology, um, in order to actually access a mental health visit, it's made that much mm -hmm. more available. And so it's actually expanded the availability of mental health practitioners so that you're not just localized to the regional support, but perhaps you can go beyond that. So that should be something we keep in mind um, as we think about accessing mental health care and, 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 and one maybe positive that has come out of this. And for people who are watching who may have put their mental health on hold, uh, meaning seeking treatment for it or any r anything related to their health, who they are afraid to go to a hospital, to go visit uh, their doctor, what, what do you want them to know? Thanks to the, thanks to the amazing work um, that has been done um, by generating the vaccine and people stepping forward and being vaccinated, uh, patients stepping forward and getting vaccinated, uh, we have seen a precipitous drop in, in the hospital census of people infected by COVID. And so we can, we can feel safer and safer about going out um, and living life and getting the help that we need. Um, so real kudos uh, to those pharmaceutical companies, uh, to the epidemiologists, to the mental health community, and to healthcare as a whole that has done such of a heroic task in helping us get back to normal. And kudos to you. And we're not letting you go. You're going to stick with us for the next segment. So Dr. Ricardo White, uh, stay, sit there, sit tight. And uh, still ahead, we are back with Dr. White to talk about more of the mental health consequences of the pandemic right after this. A new study out of Oxford University raises fears that even those who have recovered from COVID-19 might not be out of the woods. That study found that one out of three people who have survived the coronavirus is diagnosed with a neurological or psychiatric condition within six months of being infected. So we're back now with psychiatrist Dr. Ricardo White to talk more about the mental and neurological impact of COVID-19. So Dr. White, I'm curious what you make of this Oxford study. Well, on the surface, it, it sounds very scary. Um, so that you're, you're wondering to yourself, hey, um, am I at risk? Um, well, so it's a great chance to, of course, stay connected to your psychiatric provider, to your neurological provider. Um, but if COVID-19 has shown us anything, it, it's shown us that we as, as human beings, we've been designed to resilience. Um, so we're talking about the brain and the brain, just like a muscle, is incredibly resilient with the right rehabilitation. So you want to connect with your doctor if you have any concerns, um, whether it's your psychiatrist, whether it's your neurologist, so that you can get the appropriate diagnosis. But then you can have the confidence um, that with the right treatment, with the right rehabilitation, there can often be amazing improvement, especially when you get at it. Um, quickly and early. Well, one of the questions, part, one of the uh, conditions, I should say, that COVID patients frequently describe is, you mentioned the brain, brain fog uh, or some sort of memory problem. So uh, is, is this a mental health issue or is this a COVID-19 related issue or do they overlap? 
Well, in this study, they, they went through great lengths to, to see if, you know, this was the sequelae um, of COVID, and there was some suspicion that it, that it was or is. Um, the bottom line is, you know, I, I feel sometimes that, that we place a lot of emphasis on the diagnosis and not quite as much energy on the treatment. Hmm. And so whether it's, whether, whether, regardless of what you call it, Mm. Our pri my priority as a human would be, hey, I want to get my brain as sharp as possible. Right. And so you have a role in that. So you absolutely want to stimulate your brain. You want to learn new activities. Um, you, of course, want to get your healthcare provider correctly diagnosing things and making sure that the treatment um, that is appropriate is, in fact, being implemented. But on your end, you want to stimulate your brain. Your brain operates and is guided by the law, use it or lose it. Use hmm. it judicially or lose it. And so you want to develop new skills. You want to be challenging your brain like? um, because it is capable of neuroplasticity. And so that means that it's able to form new connections within the neurons. Um, and, and overall, it is going to adjust itself to support the activity of your choosing. The brain is also capable of neurogenesis. So that's new neuronal for formation. Um, but what drives that is you challenging it um, to stimulate its growth and its, um, and its evolvement. It's like the body um, that about to be physically fit, you got to move, right? And so you're, you're telling your brain to, to work out essentially. So are you recommending reading? Are you make, recommending crosswords? Well, you know, what, what are your yes. recommendations? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, um, so, but, but it's especially learning a new skill. So um, in, in the book Peak, you know, the, the new science of um, high performance, and I'm sorry, I'm paraphrasing, um, but it talks about the role of deliberate practice in skill acquisition. But when you're, a, when you're gaining a new skill, there is amazing neuronal re-networking. Um, uh, it, it, it's just what the brain loves to do. And these are some of the ways that the research is showing us um, are ways where you can stab off things like, for example, whether it's dementia, dementia or um, cognitive slowing. Um, so exercise, you know, um, eating appropriately, uh, th these are some of the things that you can do to keep your brain as sharp as possible. Um, but it is a, you, you can treat it like a muscle so mm -hmm. that if you stimulate it with appropriate activity, um, it's going to improve and reduce your risk of some of these, um, you know, long-term sequelae. Okay, I'm thinking about everybody who, well, so many people who are on their phones constantly uh, these days, and I think about video games. So what about video games? Is that good brain stimulation? It depends on the video game, Marla. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but, um, go ahead. It depends on the video game, and it depends on how much. Clearly, 12 hours is a little too much, <laughs> and, 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 and generally, um, when you're seeing other aspects of your life fall apart as a result of the activity, this is not a good idea. Um, so I'm talking about things that you're seeing actually enhance maybe your thinking speed or they're actually enhancing areas of your life. So there are hobbies that we can take on that will enrich our lives. And, as, and if we make poor choices with some of the hobbies that we choose, it will actually um, destroy our lives and hurt our mm. connections to our family. But the idea that we're getting at is you want to stimulate your brain um, with healthy activities, including skill acquisition, learning and reading and, 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 and living. Is there, uh, last question here, is there a concern in your profession of an ongoing long-term spike in mental health issues, pandemic related? Absolutely, there, there's so much unknowns. And so the research community is obviously feverishly trying to get answers to these questions. Um, and, and, and naturally, if we can um, identify that there is going to be a spike, of course, then we want to address it. Um, but it, it, it is to a degree an unknown, and mm -hmm. we're just trying to... Um, and, but, but one thing we can be confident of is much like the body is resilient, we as a human culture are resilient. Uh, and the pandemic has shown us whether it's through vaccines or through our efforts, that our legacy is triumph. Mm -hmm. um, one way or another, we find a way.
Very good. We'll end it right there. Dr. Ricardo White with the Community Hospital of San Bernardino. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Marla. All the best to you. And stay well. Yes, you too. Coming up next on Fox 11 News in depth after a year of isolation from friends and classmates, kids are going back to school. We look at how to help them navigate their fears and emotions. Coming up after this. Welcome back to Fox 11 News in depth. Children have been dealing with so many issues since the pandemic began. Stress, isolation, fears, confusion. It's no wonder some have trouble coping. Joining us to talk about the impact of the COVID crisis on kids is Children's Hospital LA psychologist Karen Rogers. Welcome, Dr. Rogers. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. What can you tell us about the impact to children during the pandemic? You know, we, ha we have a lot of, I think, anecdotal evidence that the pandemic has been really stressful for kids, not just the isolation, but, you know, they've lost so many opportunities to do things that are important to them. And they've been faced with family stressors, the anxiety about what the pandemic means for them, the difficulty of um, distance learning. So I think for many, many children, this has been a very hard year. Well, we have a lot to unpack since you just, you know, explained it and put that the big umbrella over this last year for kids. So what should parents really be watching out for in terms of behaviors and maybe, you know, being able to open up to their kids and getting their kids to open up? So, you know, returning to school, things opening back up, it represents another big change for kids and um, everybody will need a period of adjustment. And so I think in the short term, kids who, um, you know, are more irritable or um, anxious about going back to school or going out into the world, I would see that as expectable. But if it lasts longer than a week or two, or if it is severe enough that it makes it difficult for them to do things that they need to do as kids, that's when I would be more concerned. And if in fact that's what parents are, end up seeing, then how do parents respond to that? Well, I think it's important to um, do, first of all, basic things to help children feel more secure and ready for the changes. Things like letting them know what's, what to expect, and acknowledging that it's hard, that this is a big change um, and that they may, might need some time to adjust. And then helping kids to identify coping tools that they can use when they're feeling worried or um, upset about the changes so that we're building on their own natural resilience. What are some of those coping tools? So, you know, it, it varies a lot from child to child, talking about it, spending time with your family, finding fun, distracting things to do. Those are all things that um, most children find helpful when they're going through something difficult. And then, you know, for younger children, there might be some kind of a comfort object that they want to um, kind of, you know, connect mm -hmm. to a stuffy or a special blanket. Um, for younger children also, um, you know, using their imagination can be a helpful way for them to cope. And then for older children, we can begin to teach them more and more, um, you know, uh, relaxation and stress management tools. What about just having the conversation with the little itty bitty kids out there for, for parents who have the younger kids and they, they don't want to frighten them, but here they are, we're, we're having to talk about a pandemic and now readjusting to quote normal life. Uh, what's your advice to have that conversation? Yeah, so remember that um, for a child, a year is, feels a lot longer than it does for adults. And so I think, um, you know, it's, it's not so much a sense of returning to normal for them as it is returning to something more new for them. Hmm. Uh, so helping them to like know what to expect, you know, telling them what's gonna be different now, you're gonna be going to school, you're gonna be going to school from, you know, nine o'clock to lunchtime. When you come home, grandma and grandpa will be here to take care of you so that they know what their new routine is gonna be. And what about really the impact of distance learning for this past year? Yeah, you know, we have heard from many children who are just 
kind of fed up with distance learning. I think it's for some kids, it's been really great. Hmm. And for many kids, it's been really, really difficult. So, um, you know, children who are returning to school and some of their learning at school is still using, um, you know, kind of a um, video conferencing platform can feel really frustrated by that. I think it will take some time for kids to settle back into a school, typical school situation. And when they do go back to that situation, a lot of it's a hybrid schedule. Uh, so there's another uh, adjustment that kids are having to make. What do you make of that? It, yeah, it's hard. Kids, um, well, all of us really, as Dr. White said, you know, dealing with uncertainty raises everybody's anxiety. And that's true for kids as well as for adults. And so again, like giving them some sense of predictability is important, but also helping them to learn that you know, part of life is learning, part of growing up is learning how to uh, deal with change because change is a constant for all of us. Could you list some of the symptoms that parents should be looking for or behaviors that parents should be on the lookout for if, if they're starting to see their kids close off to them? So um, I think about um, function in a way similarly to what Dr. White described for adults. Hmm. So for children, we want children to be able to do the things that kids typically do to grow up. So to sleep, to eat, to learn, to play, to have relationships. And when mental health symptoms, when anxiety, fears, unhappiness really starts to get in the way of those things, that's when I would look for additional support for children. But regardless, all children really would benefit from the adults around them mm. opening a conversation about, you know, you've had some changes about how you're going to school and how is that going for you and how are you feeling about it? Very good. All right. Well, Dr. Karen Rogers, we thank you so much for Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. We'll be back with more Fox 11 News in depth right after the break. That's it for this week's Fox 11 News in depth. Thank you for being with us. We do have a quick update on our host, Hal Eisner. He is recovering after being hit by a suspected drunk driver. Hal tells us he is making strides in his physical therapy. Take a look at this video he sent. He's going places. Oh, <laughs> This is a first right here. Yes, look at that. Hal says it is the first time he's been able to do a full revolution with the pedal with his injured knee. That is major progress. We wish you the best, Hal, and we'll see you all of you right here on In-Depth next week. Thanks for being with us.